Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Home. This is our regular weekly message, and today we're starting a brand new mini series entitled Dying to Self. And this first message is entitled It's Not About You. See, life and society has taught us to ask these questions What's in it for me? How does this benefit me? What can I get out of this? What can I gain from this? When we are asked to volunteer for some type of duty in church or to help with maybe the, the, the nursery or kids church or because the church is so short-handed, our first response is, let me pray about it. Knowing fully well that we're not going to pray about nothing. That is the churchy answer to avoid the humiliation of saying, no, you cannot count on me. Why is this? Could the reason be that we think too much of ourselves? That we think about our own comforts instead of what God has called us to do? Let us look a little deeper into this. Turn with me, please, to our scripture found in Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 through 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with each other, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The first thing that Paul says in the scripture we just read is, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. He's telling us, do not do anything. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. What he's actually saying is this, it's not about you. It's not even about us. It's all about God, and He is the one we are to please. Now, could it be, and I'm just thinking here, could it possibly be that when we're asked to do something, we say, let me pray about it, instead of volunteering? Could the reason that we say that, could it be that it's because of selfish ambition? Or better yet, the lack of spiritual ambition. We only have ambition for the things that affect us financially or affect our own comfort. If we had to jump up and down and holler and shout to win a million dollars, you better believe there will be a whole lot of shaking and hollering going on. Would be like, look out toes, I'm jumping, plug your ears, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. I remember one time many years ago when uh, I was at work and we were talking about a show that I saw while I was in the military, while I was serving. And the, the woman that was there in the conversation, she said she would never eat monkey brains. And I said to her, you probably would eat monkey brains if you were starving. She said, I wouldn't eat monkey brains even if I was starving. But maybe for a million dollars or something, I would eat monkey brains. So I couldn't believe what it was that I was hearing. She would not eat monkey brains to survive, but for a million dollars, she's eating. No ifs, ands, or buts, she's eating monkey brains. We have our priorities totally wrong and totally backwards. It's not about us. It's not about money. It's not about finances. It's not about climbing the corporate ladder. It's not about any of these things. 
It's all about Jesus and Him crucified. And even more importantly, it's about Jesus being resurrected on the third day and now seated at the right hand of God, at the right hand of power. And that He's coming back for us one day. That's what it's all about. This world that we live in, this world that we know, it's quickly passing away and eternity is approaching at a very high rate of speed. And we need to be prepared when eternity reaches us because Jesus is coming back really, really soon. But yet, with all of this that we see happening, with all the end times prophecies being fulfilled, with all that's going on, we know that Jesus is about to return. Yet, in the church, there's still backbiting. There's still this looking out for self, looking out for me attitude. There's pride. There's jealousy. And it's all in the church. Brothers and sisters, this ought not be. We are called to work in God's ministry. Look at the very next verse, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We are to serve each other in humility. This word humility is used seven times in seven different verses. Two are translated as scenticism, meaning the absence from sensual pleasures. We could get into some numerology here, but I believe it would suffice to say that Jesus expects the church, meaning his bride, to act in humility. We are to put him, we are to put Jesus first and everything else second. It's not about our pleasure. It's not about our comfort. I want us to take a quick look at Romans chapter 11, verse 36. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. All things were created by him and for him. Jesus is the creator and it was for his glory, it was for his pleasure that he created everything. So don't get caught up in this neo-pagan idea of we are little gods and everything revolves around us. God said he will not share his glory. When interpreted correctly, that means we, God's creation, are not partakers in the glory that belongs to him and to him alone. Secondly, we are to value others above our own selves in all humility. That means we are to stop looking out for number one. Stop investing in our own best interests only. If we aren't the ones benefiting, we don't want to do it. We don't want to have anything to do with it at all. We, we say, let me pray about it because... That becomes our freedom chant. Let me pray about it. It becomes our words of wisdom. We, we, we make up a whole new Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 32 verse 1. Let it thou me prayest about it. Each of us is to take our eyes off of our own interests and place them on the interests of others. If the church of Jesus Christ would only do that, we would not have all the division in our churches. But the problem is, at least it seems to me, that the problem is that we believe that it's our life. And we have a right to feel this way. We have a right to think this way. We have a right to look out for our own best interests because... Nobody else is going to do it for us, right? But think of it this way. If Jesus bought and paid for you and for me with his own blood on the cross of Calvary, then you and me, 
belong to him and to him alone. You are no longer your own. I am no longer my own. We are no longer our own. We belong to the purchaser who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God. And if this is the case, and we believe it to be, then do you think, do you not think that Jesus knows how to look out for his own best interests? And don't you think that he will look out for the best interests of what belong to him? Because if we belong to him, he's going to look out for the best interests, our best interests, because that's looking out for his best interests. He does not need help taking care of what belongs to him. So we shouldn't be worried about things that affect us. Jesus can handle that. Therefore, if this is the case and your life is indeed not your own, then it is not about you. If you're going to grow in the Lord, you must understand that it is no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. As the scripture teaches us in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul understood that concept perfectly, and he was desperately trying to teach us. Yet, we act as if we are our own person, when obviously we are not our own. Video games, TV, personal time, even sleep gets time and attention. And you know what? Even ministry can take the place of Jesus. We would rather busy ourselves with ministry because we like that sort of thing. We, we like doing the things of God. So we got all caught up in the things of God. Instead of building a real relationship with Him, we just work for Him. We, we do, we, we, we get sidetracked and focused on something else, ministry, instead of focusing on the mundane things like prayer, like worship, if you want to call it that. But we have to call out to God. We have to seek His face while He can be called. We must submit totally to God. We must submit totally to Jesus Christ. If we're going to progress in our Christianity, if we're going to progress in our Christian walk, and we have to totally and completely submit to Him. Every one of the New Testament writers considered themselves slaves of Jesus, not sons. Because we wait in hope for a redemption. We have not fully attained it as yet. Let me tell you a mystery. Romans chapter 8, verse 23 through 25. It says, And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We pray and we act as if we have already achieved sonship. We have already achieved perfection. But just like creation, we too groan inwardly as we eagerly await, along with creation, our adoption as sons. We, our family, we're all in the process of being adopted. Like, I remember one time uh, we, we were in the process of adopting a, a little boy several years ago, but before the adoption papers could fully be processed, his mother came and took him back. He enjoyed all the pleasures and all the things of being her son. 
Why? Because to us, he was our son, and we loved him. And to our daughters, he was their little brother. Even now, whenever we see him, he still calls us mom and dad. And our daughters still call him their little brother. It is the same with God. We're called sons or children of God. And we enjoy all the rights. We enjoy all the benefits of being children of God. Siblings with the Lord Jesus and joint heirs with him. As Paul advocated in Romans chapter 8 verse 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And as children then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is one of the mysteries of God. You must understand that God calls those things that are not as if they were. He proclaims the end from the beginning. Meaning that he sees us as his children because he sees the end result. If we had achieved sonship already, then that sonship could never be taken away from us. Because Jesus said this, John chapter 8 verse 35. The slave does not remain in a house forever. The son remains forever. Therefore, if we had achieved sonship, that sonship could no, in no ways be taken away from us. It could no way be reversed because the son remains forever. But as, as it is, well, let us look at Paul. Paul in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Not that I have already attained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So we press on or press forward to that great and glorious day when Jesus will break that eastern sky and come back and get us that where he is, there we shall be also. But how do we press on? Very good question. I can tell you in three words, dying to self. John the Baptist explained it this way in John chapter 3 verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. We, ought, we often quote this, this verse, but we don't apply it to our lives. Because dying to self is not as easy. It's not a easy concept to grasp but an even harder concept to put into practice because it is contrary to nature. The natural man's main objective is to survive, to endure, to prosper. The first and most important of Maslow's hierarchy needs is derived from a person's motivation or instinctive or, or, or instinct to survive. God has placed that self-preservation in each one of us by placing eternity in our hearts according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. Dying to self is contrary to natural instincts because we no longer look out for self-interest. We no longer look out for numero uno. We pray for those who persecute us. And when we are cursed, we bless. We give to everyone who asks. And we bless and pray for our enemies. Richard Warmbrand, in his book, Tortured for Christ, said that during his prison time under, under the communist regime, they would pray for their torturers, the same people that would torture them. They would come and they would drag them out of their cells in the middle of their prayer or in the middle of a Bible study. They would beat them and they would torture them. And then they would throw them back into their cells. And those prisoners would roll over covered in blood. And they would begin to pray for the very ones who just mercilessly beat them. That is the epitome of dying to self. They no longer believed that they were their own, but they belonged to Christ. 
and it was Christ's will that everyone be saved. So no matter what they did, Christ wanted those people saved, whether they were communists or whether they were not communists. So these brothers in Christ, they would pray for the communists. Whatever it took to please Jesus is what they did. They did not try to please themselves. The book of Hebrews said it this way. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 through 34. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you own was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. This place, this earth, is not our home, not in in the way that it exists today. This is not our home. God has exceedingly great things stored up for us. A new earth he has, has promised us. He has promised us these great and marvelous things. All those who are faithful to his call. For those who do not shrink back from the plow. For those who, unlike Lot's wife, do not look back. So keep pressing on towards the prize that is before us. Press on to gain that crown that is stored up for each one, that crown of life. We need to encourage each other to press on. We need to encourage each other to hold on. Be encouraged, brother. Be encouraged, sister. No matter what's going on in your life, be encouraged. There's better things awaiting us. We must spur each other on as the scriptures instructs us to do. We must encourage each other in the things of God in doing acts of kindness. I believe the reason why more of our prayers aren't answered is because of what David said in Psalms chapter 66 verse 18 through 19. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. This is the main reason, I believe, why our prayers are not answered. And we don't see more of God's glory. We store up iniquity in our heart. For example, when someone upsets us, we would rather stew than to just let it go. Just give it over to Jesus. We would rather give them a piece of our mind. We rant and we, we, we rave and we vent. And sometimes even if the person comes back to us and apologizes, we feel it's our right to stay upset. We haven't finished ranting and raving as yet. It is my right to be upset. That, my friends, are hindrances to prayers. It's hindrances to the answers to prayers. Why? Because when we rant and rave, we are now cherishing iniquity in our hearts. It stems from a heart of pride. We have to stop that foolishness if we want to walk in the power of God. We must be pure in heart. We must walk purely, righteously before God. We can't be on the internet looking at pornography and, uh, and, and visualizing and, uh, and, and doing sexual acts that God does not uh, approve of. We must walk pure, righteous, holy before Him. It's not that signs and wonders and miracles and healings stopped when the last apostle died. It's because we have stopped dying to self. We feel that it's our right to be upset. It's our right to get even. It's our right to feel this way. It's our right to feel offended. It's our right to respond harshly. Because after all, he has, he has talked to me harshly. It's our right to rant and rave. The truth is, 
We've lost the fear of God. According to John Bunyan, we have no more fear of God. We don't have messages in the fear of God. I personally have never preached a message in the fear of God. I think I need to preach a message in the fear of God. I haven't, but I think I will. The fear of God was very prevalent in days of iniquity. Let me quote what John Bunyan said. He said, Yea, when Christ comes to judge the world, he will give reward to his servants, the prophets, and to his saints, and to them that fear his name, small and great. Revelation 11, 18. Now I say, since the name of God is that by which his nature is expressed, and since he naturally is so glorious and comprehensible, his name must need be the object of our fear. And we ought always to have a reverent awe of God upon our hearts at what time soever we think of or hear his name. But most of all, in worship and prayer. End of quote. I want us to take an evaluation of ourselves. I want us to do it right now. I want you to consider this. One, when you're upset, and someone presents you with the word of God, do you feel encouraged or do you feel irritated? When you're having a normal conversation and someone turns that conversation Godward, do you feel a small tinge of frustration or do you get excited about the change of subject? When you're feeling defeated or having a meltdown and someone tries to encourage you with the things of God, with scripture, does it inspire you or do you feel annoyed by it? When things aren't going your way and you just want to be left alone and someone quotes scripture, does it do more to rile you or calm you? If you're answered any of those to the negative, then you need to, one, check your salvation, or two, check your fear of God, or three, check your commitment to Jesus. It's no way that if you have all three of these functioning in you, that you will feel anything but encouraged by the things of God. The bottom line is our scripture, is what the scripture said that we just read. We are to be of the same mindset as Jesus, who although he was God, did not use it to his advantage, but rather took the position of a servant in order to fulfill the will of God. Not us though, his followers. We think we are sons, therefore, God, our Father, wants me happy. But think about it. Is God more interested in your comfort? Is God more interested in your happiness or in His will being done and His commandments being obeyed? You consider Luke chapter 17, verse 7 through 10. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No. He says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you must say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. So don't get caught up in your pride. But consider yourself mere unworthy servants. You have done nothing more than to do what is merely expected of you to do. So, unworthy servant, let me ask you a question. Are you doing your will or are you doing God's will? Is it you that you're pleasing or is it God that you're pleasing? God is a holy God, a strong and mighty warrior. He is a mighty king, and he will not share his glory with anyone. He will not allow his name to become, become common. God will not accept second place in your life or in my life. So tell me, 
Have you placed God in second place? Or have you placed Him where He belongs? In first place? Or have you placed God on the throne? God is first. He's foremost. He's above all. God is our Savior. He died for you. And He died for me. If you haven't repented, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but you would like to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, all you have to do is to ask. But you say, how do I ask, Brother Kenny? Well, just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to die to self and to live to you. Help me to put on a cloak of righteousness. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my heart. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. And help me to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now what I want you to do is to get a Bible and read that Bible. Highlight those verses. Memorize those verses. Find a Bible believe in church. A church that believes in holiness and righteousness. Who believes in the power of God. Join that church. Be disciple in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in to the joy of the Lord. Um, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.